Come, Holy Spirit, and kindle the fire that is in us. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and see through them. Take our souls and set them on fire. Amen. There's an old story about a distinguished Scottish minister who dreamed that he had gone to heaven. There he was, St. Peter, standing at the gate. And the minister said to St. Peter, You know, I am the minister who preached to those large congregations Sunday by Sunday. St. Peter said sadly, We've never heard of you. But then Peter added, Are you by any chance the man who used to go into his garden every morning to feed the sparrows? And when he replied that he was indeed that man, St. Peter said with a smile, Come in. The master of the sparrows wants to thank you. We easily imagine it is our great works which distinguish our lives. We tend to believe the grander the work, the greater its importance. We think people with powerful positions are, by definition, more important than people who don't hold such authority. I mean, after all, they're doing big things. So it's easy to believe that Jesus is just wrong when he says, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. Servant? Slave? These don't sound like concepts that will move us ahead in the reality show we know as life. We're not at all sure that caring for the sparrows will actually put any points up on the cosmic tote board. The scripture we heard this morning from Isaiah comes from what biblical scholars call the servant songs. Most of us know these verses not from having read them in their context, but because we've heard them in Handel's great oratorio, Messiah. There's a broad general movement from the servant as interpreted as all of Israel to the servant as a single Israelite who takes on Israel's vocation to be the restorer of God's chosen people, to be the light of the nations. The fourth and final servant song, our lesson today, sees the servant's death and vindication as the means by which the Lord enacts the forgiveness, healing, and restoration of his chosen people, and indeed all the people of the world. Like a sin offering, the servant's suffering brings forgiveness to many. Sound familiar? It's easy to understand why the early Christians locked on to these passages as a foreshadowing of the coming Christ. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. The message is clear. We will be saved not by a powerful king, but by a servant. Now, maybe the hymn, Come to Dark Gethsemane, was an early tip-off of the content of the sermon. (laughs) Stewardship sermons are always tough, right? But we're embarking upon a pledge campaign beginning today at St. Bart's entitled Planting Seeds of Love. The Stewardship Committee liked the idea of inviting the congregation to plant financial seeds which will grow into love. Kate DiTullio and Scott Compton will say more about this in just a little bit. But we are inviting you, all of you, asking you, pleading with you, 
And yes, eventually it may even sound like begging to you to care about the ministry which goes on in this place enough to make an actual, tangible, generous financial gift to the church. And what we are really asking is, will you be a servant? So to begin with, we're asking you to engage in this process prayerfully. We're hoping you and your partner, if that applies, will sit down and talk and make a prayerful decision to support this church and its ministries. The conversation is actually an important part of the process because if you don't discuss it, it's as if the question, will you be a servant, can be ignored. And some people have pretended their financial gifts to St. Bart's don't really matter. They've thought, consciously or unconsciously, that other, better resourced people will pick up the slack if they don't contribute. There is a phenomenon that might be called tipping, where people give the church a token amount as if to say, hey, thanks, we're good now, we appreciate it. Now, please forgive me if this candid talk about money offends you or puts you off in any way. If I'm speaking to you in a rather unvarnished way about financial matters, I'm doing so because it's been said our congregation is not fully aware of the deep need we have for financial contributions from our members. Let no one within the sound of my voice be confused. We, like many, like most large urban parishes, are in need of greater generosity from our par parishioners. 60% of our income comes from mission supporting activities. 40% of our income comes from the membership, but that 40% is crucial. We're running a lean organization, and I can say that with some confidence because an independent group of consultants told us so. Our challenge is not simply to decrease costs, but to increase our revenue. We're still climbing out of COVID. We're rebuilding our children and youth programs. We're rebuilding our chorister program. We're rebuilding our outreach programs. We're growing our Imagine Worship contemporary service on Thursday evenings. We're restoring our nine o'clock service. We're establishing ourselves as a model congregation in terms of our adult educational offerings. We're investing in our choirs. And because we sold some air rights, money which can largely only be used for the restoration of the building, we've been able to do some amazing things in terms of renovating this architectural gem of a church. We put more than $20 million into renovations over the past eight years. And if you walk around, you can see it looks great. And as you can also see, there's still work to be done. We haven't got it all done yet. Now, people come up to me with some regularity, and I appreciate this, and they say, Dean, St. Bart's feels so vibrant. I'm seeing more young people. I'm seeing more people of color. I love the ambitious program you all are doing. It's amazing. Please understand that none of this is accidental. We have been the lay and ordained leadership of this church. We have been purposeful about building our clergy team in such a way that we would have the broadest appeal across the broadest demographics. We have been purposeful in recruiting and hiring some of the finest staff in the Episcopal Church. The question is, do we want to support this development? Will you be a servant? We're still believing that if we build it, they will come. We're still believing that if they come, they will support the good works they see happening here. 
because we are all called to be servant leaders. The Reverend Heidi Haverkamp writes that in 1944, C.S. Lewis gave a talk to students at King's College at Cambridge called The Inner Ring. It was about this longing to be safely inside imagined lines and walls of belonging. Haverkamp observes, James and John may have asked Jesus to sit at his right and left hand because they wanted power and prestige. But I wonder if they also wanted a secret intimacy with Jesus apart from the other disciples. Could we blame them? Don't we seek that intimacy as well? Lewis said that until you conquer the fear of being an outsider, an outsider you will remain. It is friendship and service that offer us real belonging. Today, I'm inviting all of you inside. I'm inviting you to come closer. Closer. As Jesus explains in his reproach to James and John, the kingdom is not about who's in and who's out, nor is Christian greatness about who's on top and who's underfoot. Glory and greatness in Christ comes from seeing others, helping others, and loving others as God in Christ sees, helps, and loves us. It means believing that we're all on the inside even if we aren't sure we or our neighbor is actually worthy of it. It is sowing seeds of love. It is servant leadership. Come closer. Come closer. Once there was a woman who lived in a small central European village She was a nurse and had devoted her life to caring for her neighbors. She was there at birth, at death. She bound up scratches, bruises, broken bones, as well as sitting through many nights with the seriously ill. In the course of time, she died. She had no family, so the villagers decided to hold a lovely funeral service for her. But the village priest had to remind them that she could not be buried in the cemetery as the town was Roman Catholic and the woman was a Protestant. The villagers protested, but the priest held firm. It wasn't easy for him since he too had been nursed by her. Nonetheless, the canons of the church were explicit she would have to be buried outside the cemetery fence. The day of the funeral arrived and the whole village accompanied her casket to the cemetery where she was buried outside the fence. But that night, after dark, a group of villagers went back and what did they do? They moved the fence. They moved the fence. We might even say that love moved that fence. We might say that that woman's servant ministry to the people of that village transformed them and made them much more concerned about who was inside the fence than who was outside. We might say that she wasn't merely modeling servant ministry she actually became a servant to all the people of that village. And in becoming a servant, she transformed those people. What used to mean a lot to them suddenly didn't mean much of anything. They were no longer interested in who was a Protestant, who was a Catholic. Those categories, they didn't matter. The people of that village just knew that she loved them. And they knew, even if they didn't have the words to properly describe it, that they loved her, 
two. So here's the question from today's gospel lesson. Will you be a servant?